Welcome everyone to the webinar, How to Measure and Reduce Plastics in Healthcare. My name is Arianna Gamba. I'm the Circular Healthcare Program Manager at Healthcare Without Time Europe, and I will be the moderator of this webinar. It take place, it takes place in the context of a plastic-free um, July. Today, we will have the pleasure to learn more from the experience of three speakers that executed plastic waste, waste audits in their facilities. We have uh, Esther from the UK. She has over 20 years of experience working in the field of sustainability, 15 of those working for the NHS. She manages a small team who coordinates sustainability activities at North Bristol NHS Trust. Years of embedding sustainable development and the trust culminated in declaring climate and ecological emergency in 2019 and 2020. And Esther is now supporting the trust in its ambition to be, uh, uh, to be carbon net zero by 2030. Hulda from Iceland has been working in sustainability issues with uh, in sustainability issues for 25 years. She has uh, spent the last five years in the healthcare sector and with a master's degree in environmental sciences from University of Gothenburg, Hulda is responsible for environmental and social sustainability issues at Landspitali, which uh, is reducing its environmental impact since uh, 2012. Susanne from Denmark has been working uh, with development projects uh, within energy and environment for more than 25 years. Years. Since 2016, uh, Suzanne has been working for the Central Denmark region and is currently employed as Circular Economy Advisor within the Department of Procurement and Clinical Engineering. She holds a Master of Science in Economics Management and a Bachelor Degree in Textile Design. All our speakers are part of the Healthcare Without Time Europe project towards plastic free healthcare in Europe uh, that I will present to you uh, shortly. Before uh, we hear from them, allow me to briefly introduce Healthcare Without Harm Europe. We are an environmental NGO working with our network of healthcare systems and healthcare providers and other environmental health organizations. We have a global reach. We have office in Europe, the US, Southeast Asia, South America and regional partners around the world. We are inspired by the Hippocratic Oath, Do No Harm to people or the environment. And our vision is that uh, healthcare mobilizes its ethical, economic, um, and political influence to create a sustainable, equitable, and healthy world. Our mission is to transform the healthcare sector so it, it reduces its environmental footprint, inspire change within their communities, and lead the global movement for environmental and health justice. We have over uh, 90 members across the European region, reaching almost uh, 5,000 hospitals, health centers, and healthcare providers. And together with our members in Europe, we are a part of a, a global movement, uh, the Global Green and Healthy Hospital, that is made of almost 1,500 members, representing over 40,000 hospitals and health centers. Uh, members can connect uh, via the um, GJHH uh, Connect platform and membership is completely free of charge. So get in touch if you would like to uh, be part of this community. In Europe, our programmatic work encourages the decarbonization of the European healthcare sector, promotes sustainable food production and consumption, and aims to reduce the presence of pharmaceuticals in the environment and exposure to antimicrobial resistance. With uh, our circular healthcare program, uh, we want to accelerate the transition of healthcare towards a circular economy with toxic free products where the supply chain is more sustainable, products last longer, and the waste hierarchy is properly respected. And as a practical example of our circular healthcare activities, uh, there is our pilot project called Towards Plastic Free Healthcare in Europe that began uh, last year. Of course, Healthcare Without Harm acknowledges that plastic play an important role in providing healthcare, but we also recognize that plastics as a negative health and environmental impact across the life cycle, from oil and gas extraction to the use of toxic additives and the waste and plastic, uh, um, that, uh, the pollution that generates. So with this project, 
we aim to transform plastic use in healthcare facilities and support them in their transition to a, a circular economy model in which unnecessary plastic is reduced. The project uh, builds on three pillars, research, education and innovation, and running plastic waste audit at different hospitals is a crucial step of the project's research uh, phase. Waste audits, uh, you will see later also from our speakers, are a good method to quantify waste, uh, identify the consumption partners of the uh, place you're auditing, as well as the potential areas of improvement to prevent waste in the first place. You can see things that are less evident when analyzing procurement data, and uh, the data can also be used to check uh, if waste is segregated properly. Um, the data are interesting because uh, they also help build an understanding perhaps of the type of uh, quantities and the type of plastics uh, that you can find in the, uh, that are generated. And they also, the waste audits normally are also relatively easy to do or to repeat uh, to monitor progress compared to other uh, environmental impact assessment study. Uh, also, if the staff is assisting you in undertaking the audit, this can help to raise awareness about uh, plastic consumption in the, in the facility. Uh, within our project, the audit were prepared and executed with the consultancy action. And the following one, you have been, we are missing some of the key steps to be followed in case you want to uh, do an audit. I will not read them out, uh, but um, we will share the slides after the webinar and later this year, we were going to publish a uh, toolkit that can support you in this process. Again, here are some of the slides. Um, again, here are some of the steps that um, uh, are listed in the methodology of the waste audit. Uh, what I want you to retain is that uh, once everything is ready for the audit, you can uh, follow two methods, either you sort, wait, and record the data waste back, uh, one waste back at a time, or you can, um, and, and this approach requires fewer containers for each plastic category, or you can sort all waste bags uh, of one waste stream before waiting and recording the data. Well, recommend you, of course, to take uh, many detailed pictures of the items during the process. And um, we provided the participants with a waste audit database where products are divided into main categories and subcategories. Here you have the screenshot of the waste uh, audit database. Obviously, it's too, too, too small to read it, but um, it is how the waste uh, database looks like. Uh, you will have to indicate the department source type of waste stream, type of products, the product itself, um, whether the plastics is labeled or not, or you can guess what type of plastic it is, the number of items, their weight, and, and so on. Initially, we also had included the manufacturer, the manufacturer and country of manufacture, but we um, removed it because this data can be more easily gathered through the procurement uh, data. Um, so the preliminary results, you will see more detailed results from uh, Esther and Hulda who participated in this, uh, in this process of the waste audit. Um, but here you have the uh, more general results that compares the hospital in the project. Um, we have here the results from four hospitals. And out of the 1,168 kilograms of waste audited, um, 577 were, or 50% of them uh, were uh, plastic. So the waste analyzed uh, included general, sanitary offensive and plastic recycling waste streams. So it is important to note that since clinical waste and other uh, recycling streams like paper and metal were not analyzed, this percentage is not completely accurate. Nevertheless, the extent of the problem can still be assessed. For example, uh, in the first hospital across all the worlds, we have um, 68% of sanitary waste and 34% of general waste that is plastic. You can see similar data in the hospital number three. And uh, we can see that in some hospital, the plastic recycling stream is uh, low in proportion of the total uh, waste, which means that only really a small part of the total healthcare plastics is sent for uh, recycling and their improvements can be made. Uh, something that is also interesting is that almost 40% of all the plastic items analyzed were mixed materials. 
and you will hear probably from Susanne why this is important, um, including paper and plastic mixes. So, and in this case, uh, most of the items were uh, unknown on our labels, so we didn't know what type of plastics they have. And uh, similar, this also applied to um, almost 20% of the non-mixed material items that were uh, unlabeled or unmarked. Uh, these are some pictures taken from the from the audits. Uh, might be familiar to some of you. I think it's good to note that not only medical items uh, can be found, but also a lot of containers, plastic cups, forks, etc., have been found during the during the audits. Here again, comparing uh, the uh, overall results from the hospital. Um, here we were able to include five hospitals because we were able to include their high level data from audits we ran uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, but in, in red, you have the items that were found most often in the waste bags. And uh, the most common uh, funded items were gloves across all the five hospitals, nappies uh, for three of them, wipes were also quite common, as well as gowns, aprons and medical packaging. The um, empty cells, as you see in the presentation, don't mean that the hospital didn't have these items, but they weren't in the top 10 uh, funded uh, items. And um, here you have a more detailed list of the top 10 items found during the audits, uh, but we will hear more about uh, those uh, from Esther and Hulda, of course. And uh, while I'm passing the ball to Esther, I take the chance to thank our donors that are supporting this project, European Commission Life Grant and the Flotilla Foundation. Esther, with that, over to you. Lovely, thank you very much. Uh, I will just share my screen. Here we go. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Esther Coffin Smith, and I'm the Sustainable Development Manager at North Bristol NHS Trust. Um, and I'm just going to take you through our experiences um, at uh, my hospital during our waste audits um, at the end of last year. Uh, so, just a quick introduction to the hospital. So, we are uh, our biggest site is on the Southmead Hospital site, uh, which is in North Bristol, in the southwest of England, in the UK. We have. Uh, um, over 900 beds in our main building and 75% of those are, are individual bedrooms and we also have 25% that are four bedded uh, bays for patients that need um, uh, greater levels of care. We have 48 intensive care beds. We are also a, a regional trauma centre um, for the southwest. We have over 8,000 staff across all of our sites. Um, and just for a bit of reference, in 2019-20, we generated 2,841 tonnes of waste across all of the different categories. And um, for our audits, it was uh, my team, the sustainability team, that led the, um, led the audits. So starting with the process, how did we plan the audits? A lot of the decisions um, that we made were dictated, unfortunately, by COVID. So we were only able to choose two wards to audit, and they were the only two what were called COVID green. Um, so um, all of the staff and patients had been tested. And it was only from these two wards, which was orthopedic and um, neuro, where we were able to um, uh, collect waste for the audit. Uh, we... Um, uh, couldn't use the venue that we had planned to use for the audits again because of COVID. So we have a, a dedicated waste store and that was our um, ideal location. Um, however, because of the quantities of COVID waste being generated, there just wasn't room for us. So we had to find an alternative. We also had to um, then employ some people to help us. We had hoped to use volunteers, but again, because everybody was so incredibly busy, um, in the end, we chose to um, pay for that resource to support us instead. Uh, we then had to organise uh, an alternative venue. We had to um, sort out um, protective equipment such as the anti-needle stick uh, gloves and uh, wipes, litter pickers, bags for repacking the waste, uh, some scales, the, 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 the boxes to se separate all of the categories of waste into, um, tables to sort the waste on and things like that. And um, 
a compiler risk assessment before we started the activity. And then we also had to arrange the logistics and the communications for the collection. So we had to make sure that all of the areas that the waste was coming from, um, that there was clear signage in their disposal hold so that um, people knew where to, to put the waste. So we didn't forewarn the two wards that we were auditing, just the waste teams that collected um, from those wards. So we didn't want the staff to behave any differently from how they normally would do. Um, so they didn't know just the, the people that collect their waste. Um, we had to communicate how we wanted the bags to be labelled, where they were to be stored, um, and how they would be uh, moved to the location that we were doing the audit on the day in question. So what did we actually do? Well, we collected 48 hours worth of waste from those two wards um, that amounted to 267 kilos worth. Um, we then quarantined the waste uh, for a period of time. And then we conducted the audits over two days. So um, we were a little bit concerned how long it would take us when we saw the number of bags that we had, but we were able to do it over two days. There were six of us uh, led by the Axiom um, advisor. And we examined each ward's waste one stream at a time. We started with the offensive or the, the sanitary waste, uh, then did general waste and then did um, the recycling. So what did we actually do? So we took each waste stream separately and we started by weighing the full bags from each of those streams. We then emptied each bag at a time and separated out the contents into the plastic element and the non-plastic element. We weighed the non-plastic element and put that to one side. And then we went through each of the different plastic fractions and put them into different bins depending on uh, uh, what they were made of. So the gloves would go in a box, the aprons would go in a box, nappies would go in another box. And then we would, um, each time a box became full, we would weigh it um, and we would enter the details into the um, laptop. Uh, and you saw a brief view of this screen that um, Ariana showed earlier. When we had finished, we had 30, uh, uh, 372 separate weights logged for the, um, the, the, waste that we, uh, the waste that we looked at. So we then looked at the waste uh, composition. So um, not just the plastic element, but the general waste um, element um, as well. For orthopedic waste, the biggest fraction was domestic or non-clinical waste. And for um, our neuro ward, the biggest fraction was the offensive hygiene waste or um, sanitary waste. For the plastic elements, we then looked at the top 10 plastic uh, types by mass, which gave us uh, wipes, um, nitrile gloves, and aprons and gowns, which made um, up 61% of the total plastics that we found in, um, in our bag waste. It would be really interesting to compare this with waste generation in non-COVID times to see whether we have the same percentages of all of these products. So cleaning wipes, for example, it may well be that we have less of those. Likewise, gloves might make up a, a smaller fraction in a non-COVID scenario. The medical packaging, contained items that both could and couldn't uh, be recycled. Um, so we need to do a bit more analysis to look at um, where this was placed in a non-recycling uh, stream to see if through better training and awareness, actually we could improve the segregation here. Um, so in medical packaging, peel packs where one half is paper and the other half is um, plastic, for example, we have lots of that. And in our particular trust, the plastic film can be recycled but the paper piece uh, cannot. Um, so we, we need to do more work to look at exactly uh, what's being generated. Um, and you'll notice on here that uh, black trays made up 7% um, of the plastic items that we found. Uh, now these are uh, trays that um, food is um, heated up in. So it's made in our um, catering production unit and it gets taken up to the wards in these plastic containers and they um, are designed perfectly to fit inside the ovens and the trolleys that carry the food. So they'd be an obvious thing for us to tackle in the, in the future. Um, but we know from having looked at it briefly that operationally swapping to metal um, is going to cause problems because none of the purpose-made containers fit in our ovens or our trolleys. 
So what have we, what problems have we experienced and um, uh, what lessons have we, have we learned? Uh, well, COVID has uh, restricted what it was that we wanted to do. Um, so we couldn't choose the exact areas that we wanted to audit and we were unable to um, audit our neonatal intensive care unit, um, uh, which was supposed to be the comparator clinical area across all of the hospitals participating in this project. Um, rather than using uh, volunteers, we had a small financial cost uh, to employ staff to support us to um, complete the audits. But there's a positive to that in that because we were paying them, we were guaranteed that they would uh, turn up to help us with what was not a particularly pleasant job. Um, we were quite glad when they all came back on the second day to, uh, to continue the audits. Um, a benefit of COVID um, and the lack of air travel meant that the advisor from Axion was stuck in the UK. Um, and luckily, he was available to come and help us on the day. So having, rather than having to do it remotely, using cameras and, and Wi-Fi and things, uh, we had an actual physical person that we could um, ask for help, which was really, really um, beneficial. Uh, some of the things that were highlighted through the audits um, included uh, poor segregation, so far too much waste in uh, the wrong uh, stream, uh, excessive waste of gloves and of wipes. Um, often this was associated uh, with the dispensing mechanism. So you want to take one glove or, or, or two gloves, but many gloves tumble out of the box at the same time. And equally um, with wipes, you want just one from a pack, um, but they stick together. So you, you end up taking um, you end up taking more. Um, and also we did highlight some breaches in our trust waste policy. So we had um, incorrect disposal of things like sharps, which should never be in bagged waste, but is one of the things that we found. Uh, another thing that we hadn't anticipated, um, but that proved uh, a little bit of a problem was actually the labelling of the bags with the department origin um, hadn't been very good. So next time we would give them a, a sheet it was pre-printed with the, the location of the ward and they just had to stick it then onto the, um, onto the waste sacks. And that would then help um, improve us tying waste back to a particular uh, ward. So what are the next steps of our journey to reduce plastics in healthcare? Uh, we have already started, but we're going to continue recruiting plastic champions uh, to help highlight opportunities. And in, then we will be engaging with um, key stakeholders such as procurement, catering, theatres, our cleaning staff, and infection control. We then plan to bring everybody together to a workshop to discuss the findings of the audits uh, and also the other areas where our champions are flagging that um, uh, large quantities of plastic are, are being uh, used or generated. Um, we'd like to then really focus our attention on the areas um, where correct... Det er det, jeg siger til dig. Det er det, jeg siger til dig, den løsning er ikke mulig. Jeg, jeg, jeg kan ikke løse det lige nu her. Jeg vil bare meddele det, og nu går jeg tilbage. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Um, we would then um, uh, use the results to really focus attention on key areas where correct usage would reduce plastic waste. So uh, wipes and gloves, for example, um, only using gloves where they are required. Um, so a bodily fluid or risk of chemical contamination. So a gloves off campaign, that sort of thing. Um, we would then like to um, really engage with our procurement colleagues to look at things like specifications. So plastic free wipes are available. Uh, what do we need to do internally within the trust to move to using these products? Equally, reusable gowns are already available. And where we don't already uh, use the launderable types, how can we move to this and tie it in with our uh, laundry existing laundry contract? Then we will develop an action plan and we will monitor that through our sustainable development steering group. We would also like to go back and audit our neonatal department so that we can identify the opportunities there, but also share the results with the other hospitals um, uh, so that we can um, compare our findings across that one, um, uh, that one hospital uh, type of activity. And then finally, we'd like to repeat the audits in the areas that we've already audited, but under normal circumstances, so outside of, um, outside of COVID, to see how much additional plastic waste um, was COVID related, but also how much plastic waste wasn't identified during our audits because it had gone into the infectious waste stream, which we weren't able to audit. Um, yeah, that's me. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Esther, for sharing your experience. Indeed, you were one of the, uh, let's say, lucky one that had at least a chance to do it uh, in person, while Ulda wasn't that lucky. Iceland uh, was, uh, um, well, under restriction as the UK, so they had to do it remotely, but it would be still interesting to, to hear now the comparison also with Ulda. Ulda, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> Here is my introduction. And uh, yes. Is everything fine now? Um, no? can you can you Simply? put it into can you put it into the um, yep. uh, presenter view? Isn't it is it like that now? I think it's loading. One second. Yes, it's perfect. We can see perfect. it. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> um, yes, I will go a little bit through through the process of the audit. It is very similar to what uh, Esther was uh, telling you about. So maybe I'll go briefly through it and uh, our uh, learning moments there. <clears throat> uh, just a brief introduction on Landspitali. It's the National Hospital of Iceland. We are only 360,000, but it is, uh, it is one of the biggest uh, workplaces in Iceland. It is uh, also the university hospital, and it's both specialized and general care. Uh, we have around 630 hospital beds, and uh, <clears throat> here are some numbers, and uh, uh, we serve the whole country, so it's uh, all kinds of, of procedures uh, at the hospital. Uh, the number of employees are around 5,700, so we are a little bit smaller than the uh, Bristol uh, hospital. Uh, uh, yearly, uh, to compare to Bristol again, 1,810 tons of waste, all kinds of waste. Now we are only talking about the general waste, uh, offensive waste and plastic, but we also sort in uh, other uh, waste streams like paper, cardboard, etc. And it's not included in the, in the audit. Daily, around five tons of waste, of which 1.4 tons we recycle. So just to compare... Well, here is my team, my wonderful team, which is uh, also in the introduction of Ariane. Uh, I was very lucky to to be to have this team from the beginning in the plastic project. It's uh, Hildur, which is they are all nurses, and uh, Hildur is from the procurement department, Ingun is from the hygiene department, and Kolla is from is a quality manager and former. Uh, manager of, of uh, uh, wards, so they had all. We were very quick in deciding what is this and to sort the waste. Uh, <clears throat> and of course, COVID uh, did uh, didn't help us much, and uh, there was restriction. We had to delay the audits at least one, if not two times. But we managed in December and. Uh, and as uh, Esther told you, we collected the waste from two, two wards and we didn't tell them that we were collecting the waste. And, uh, and uh, then we took a little, uh, almost two days to sort it, weigh it and uh, analyze it. And maybe we didn't, uh, we weren't so, because the... Me, uh, the consultant who helped us, he was not on site, and we didn't uh, find so many items as Esther did. I think we only um, made some 70 groups or something, not 370 as Esther did. So he has um, he has been more strict to them than us because he was only in the in the computer. Well, uh, as I mentioned. We excluded all the waste streams, so the numbers and percentage of the, the waste is uh, not including those. Um, it uh, needed some um, planning, of course, and uh, but 
I think it's worth it. That's my experience. We it took uh, we took it from 48 hours two words, and uh, I've already told you uh, all this that uh, that is said there. But you can see it's a it's it's a less waste than comes from the two words that Esther was telling you about, and I. I um, it maybe should be included that at least for the gastroenterology it was all the patient or more and, uh, the majority of the patient were in isolation and there were fewer patients than regularly so maybe forty eight hours are, aren't uh, enough I I uh, wonder well so this was uh, this was. Uh, uh, easy work when you started it. It uh, w- from the start you 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 thought that it would be very difficult. We started with one word and one stream waste stream at the time. So this was uh, this was uh, not so difficult as you could uh, uh, think in the start. And th- here are some preliminary results. Uh, Arian uh, already mentioned a little bit about the the total mass and the the ratio of plastic. But here on the left side, or uh, right side actually, you can see that it differs from from Bristol. Uh, The the main, uh, the top product category uh, in plastic sample were, were diapers. Uh, maybe not so strange coming from the gastroenterology, and uh, but you don't see the wipes as uh, dominant as in Bristol, and and for that reason this project is very interesting to compare between hospitals. Are we overusing something, or uh, could we teach other hospitals something? <clears throat> We see uh, the the amount of gloves, of course, which was uh, skyrocketing in in COVID times and even after COVID. So that's one thing we are starting to work on. Um, um, when we analyzed the waste, we saw that we didn't sort. We we saw a lot of failures at sorting waste at the wards, and even though I. I constantly, I'm constantly reminding uh, our staff on doing this right and uh, please take care and uh, etc. It's much stronger to have pictures on it. And I held uh, meetings with both the wards and I just show them this happened here and they even had contaminated waste uh, in, in the general waste and uh, needles and liquid and etc. So it, it, it's much more effective to have real pictures and show them, even though I'm not, I'm not um, punishing them. I'm only saying this happens. What can we do to uh, prohibit and, and uh, not repeat this, uh, um, this failure here, or, or so to say? Um, so the follow-up meetings were good, and I also can um, use those information in general at the hospital. So please, all wards, take care, and this and this could happen. So we also saw that there was a considerable amount of linen from the gastroenterology was in the general waste, which, of course, should not be put there, but should be washed. So there were maybe new staff or whatever, I don't know. But there you get a real uh, results and pictures and uh, and you can discuss that with the wards. We also uh, looked into how we could improve the waste setup. Could we localize the bins uh, in a different way? What about the labeling and the other waste streams? We also found that other waste streams were too much uh, dominant in the general waste, and as uh, as Bris- no, or as Esther was mentioning, we didn't analyze the contaminated waste. So clearer procedures and uh, better setups, and uh, it helped in other other uh, waste streams as well. Here you can see 
uh, all the contaminated waste in the general waste from the neonatal uh, care. So this is way too much. And uh, we found like uh, 60 pair of socks or something in the general waste. We don't know what happened. So it's, 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 uh, it's more fun than you think to, to, to look into the waste bags. Here you can see contaminated in the contaminated waste. We have a problem when we are transporting contaminated waste. There are sometimes liquids um, falling out. And here we see an uh, explanation of that. It's not, it's only put in the bags like this, and then it goes out. So this was very useful, even though it wasn't the plastic focus. So, uh, summing up, the audits highlighted uh, all kinds of waste-related issue, not only the plastic and what we can do to minimize it, but how we can improve the um, waste sorting at the hospital in general. And uh, repeating myself, hands-on results and uh, picture for discussion with uh, the wards and other stakeholders. I'm using this now because I'm having a little problem with uh, recycling uh, procedures. And now I can show them what is really there and how can we uh, improve this. And of course, COVID was um, very dominant the whole year of the project. Um, and uh, I think maybe we should also think how COVID is of course, affecting the work at the hospital and all hospitals, I assume. But how can we use this uh, COVID time and what can we learn from it? And I think also that it would have been much better to have the advisor on site. I think so. Uh, just seeing the number of uh, items that Esther showed us, 370, and uh, 70 at our site. So we were not maybe as thorough as, uh, as uh, the Bristol Hospital. Uh, I think uh, in that project, uh, having those uh, seven or eight hospitals, we will compare, as Ariana was uh, giving us insight in, we can compare between hospitals. And I know for sure uh, that we are doing something that we don't have to do and the other way around with the other hospitals. And by comparing, we can refer to other hospitals. We don't have to use all those gloves or all those wipes, et cetera. So we can, we can see the problems that we can easily solve or easily, uh, maybe not the right word, but this, those are the projects that we can go into. Uh, we, were, we are improving the waste planning and sorting at the hospital. And we, we have, uh, it's, more easily, it, it's more easy to engage the stakeholders. Uh, in August, uh, we plan on holding the workshop to discuss our audit findings. And, uh, or, and also the, the innovation part. That is, what can we do? What plastic groups will we work on? Uh, we, uh, maybe even before the audit, we, we were interested in working on, on minimizing uh, the uses of gloves, but we, we, we didn't want to uh, do it in the middle of COVID times because uh, people wouldn't have listened. But now uh, in springtime, we started the campaign of uh, minimizing uh, the use of gloves. And we know for sure that we are uh, overusing gloves. And uh, we worked this, we, we have made those posters in Icelandic, Polish and uh, English. And we just went through it. Uh, how, when do we have to use gloves? And it's uh, looking at those guidelines, it's, uh, you can see that we are overusing it, not only at the hospital, but also in our society. And we did uh, plan this along with the director of health in Iceland. So uh, we launched it in May, this uh, campaign, and we 
before the campaign, we saw uh, when comparing with the first three months uh, of 2021, when uh, COVID was almost non-existing at the hospital, and uh, compared it to 2019 before COVID, we saw that there was a 62% increase in co- in uh, glo- the uses of gloves. So there is uh, work to do. And uh, hopefully in uh, the autumn, we will see uh, impacts on, on this uh, campaign. We made this uh, little video and we sent it to all our managers and, uh, and um, use social media, etc. So... Hopefully, we will, we will uh, minimize the unnecessary use of gloves. So, and uh, <clears throat> we we have already implemented uh, some things at the hospital. I don't know where my where is my time. Maybe I've I've uh, finished my time, so I can just uh, leave it here and uh, for others to maybe get some ideas. But uh, so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hulda, for sharing your experience and also for saying that uh, the audits can be fun. <laughs> Maybe this will, uh, <laughs> it is. Encourage, uh, this will encourage uh, more people to, to look into that. And um, now we can, uh, uh, I would like to remind to our participants that uh, you can uh, uh, write in the Q&A box if you have any questions for our speakers. Um, now we move to Susanne in Denmark. Um, they didn't do the audits within the project. They did it before um, uh, the project, but uh, their results were very interested and also inspired all this uh, work in Esco Without Harm uh, uh, Europe. So it is great to have uh, Susanne here presenting their work. Uh, Susanne, the floor is your, yours. Thank you very, very much. Uh, this is right. We did the audit some time ago uh, and we did it at Aarhus University Hospital in central Denmark region. And Aarhus University Hospital is comparable to most European university hospitals. Approximately 10,000 employees and 1,000 beds, etc. And we produce uh, around 3,000 tons of waste per year. Uh, in Denmark, hospitals are organized in regions and altogether at regional level, we run 10 hospitals. Um, yes, so... Can I have the next slide, please? I'm going to talk about this plastic waste audit. So please be aware, I'm, we were auditing just plastic, not general waste, and we were auditing clean plastic waste. So this is also important to know because our figures are a little bit maybe different, but also maybe a little bit scaring when you see how much it is. And then I would like to also talk a little bit about some of the actions we have taken on on the background of this uh, waste audit. And since it was already some years ago, we did that. We did it in 2016 and we got the results in 17. We have had more time to act on it than compared to other colleagues. And some of... Uh, of uh, People here present today, among others, Hulda, uh, is also part of one of the actions we have taken uh, in developing some Nordic criteria for more sustainable packaging for the healthcare sector. So this is what I'm going to talk about. And if I get the next slide, Ariana, please. Why plastic waste? Um, well, plastic, as Ariana has already said, uh, serves a lot of purposes within the healthcare sector. Um, well, this was too fast, Ariana. Please go one back. <laughs> yeah, it's just uh, just to let us remember why we were looking into plastic waste specifically, because our nurses spent many hours every day unpacking all the very needed goods we use in the healthcare sector. But it also provokes them a lot. And we actually have nurses who have um, uh, disorders in their arms and fingers because of too much unpacking. So that was the reason why we started our plastic uh, waste audit back in 2016. It was because of the nurses' concerns and their irritation and frustration over all this packaging. 
So let's go to the next slide. Um, we did our audit in nine different wards, three patient wards and three operation departments and three auxiliary different departments. We also did it over 48 hours, um, but note here that what we did, we sorted out all the clean plastic waste. So, and by clean, we instructed the nurses that put all the uh, plastic waste, which you think from your point of view is clean enough in special bags. And then we let all the rest go. So it means there was also plastic which had been contaminated, uh, paper, all different other kinds of materials, which we did not calculate here. We have only been looking at the clean plastic packaging here. And as you can see here in the patient wards, we were not very successful in collecting or harvesting plastic waste. It was very difficult because the nurses were simply too focused on the patients. The patients are awake and there are also relatives there. Actually, we gave up to get any meaningful data out of patient wards because it was simply too difficult. The situation in the operation departments were completely different. Here, uh, everything is, is well organized and uh, uh, the patients are sedated and it helps a lot. <laughs> As you can see, the percentage of plastic packaging waste we were able to harvest in the operation departments is uniform 15%. So that's interesting. But the amount uh, in kilos is different. So you could see that there are some operations which produce more waste than others. So that's interesting in itself. And when we go to the different uh, auxiliary departments like pharmacy, intensive care preparations and radiology, you can also see here that these are also very controlled environments. For example, pharmacy, the, uh, the outcome of plastic in kilos is not very high. But the percentage of plastic uh, packaging waste that we're able to sort out is very high, 34%. Um, intensive care preparations, also controlled environment, produce a lot of plastic and a high outsource or outsourcing percentage, 32%. Radiology, uh, this is where you have a lot of different kinds of fluids you uh, inject into the patient's bodies. And it's funny because those fluids, you can send it into the body of a patient but when there are some drops of fluids left in the containers, you cannot send it to recycling. So this was interesting so that we know there's a lot of plastic, huge containers for fluids, but we did not collect those types of plastics where we knew we cannot have, uh, have it recycled. So there were uh, lots of learnings in this for, uh, for us and um, we, when we had all the plastic, we took it to a separate room where we started registering and analyzing further down. And I would like the next slide, please. Here you can see the results from the plastic waste audit. Uh, we uh, had some experts to help us with this. Um, I think not. it's not possible for ordinary clean clinical staff to detect what kind of plastic uh, it is. Um, what is interesting here is when you look at the left pie chart and you can see there is a huge chunk, which is, uh, it's blue and it's labeled ukent plast, it means unknown plastic. Um, so it means that approximately 40% of the plastic packaging we had, uh, it was not a, a possible also not for the specialists which were helping us to identify what kind of plastic is this. Uh, so this is interesting. Uh, and the reason why they could not detect what kind of plastic it is, it's because it's a very complex, different complex types of plastics. Fortunately, there were also other types of plastic which they could detect. And those they could detect are those with a, a number in brackets behind it, like LDPE, uh, like uh, PS, like HDPE, like EPS. You can also see that the amount of the detectable types of plastic are relatively small. So there is a lot of plastic packaging out there, which we cannot easily identify 
because it's very complex and it's not possible to recycle it in its present form. Uh, so if you go to the next slide, we also, it was possible for us to also organize the data we had um, according to what type of packaging, what function of packaging we had. You can see the largest type of packaging we had was peel packs. I guess you all know peel packs. Uh, it's uh, the primary packaging uh, around sterile products. And uh, you can see here we have, again, different types of plastic, sometimes, of course, in the same product. And that's because of the functionality of the packaging, which is to keep the product sterile. And in order to be able to do so, you need different um, properties of the packaging, which again means you need to use different types of plastic in the same product. And this is what is special. One of the things which is special about healthcare plastic packaging, for example, compared to household plastic packaging, this is where healthcare plastic is different because we have this need to keep our products um, sterile. So you can see it's a complex picture we get when we deep a little, um, when we dive a little deeper into the types of, of packaging. So this led us to think, okay, uh, we had imagined that we were going to do a huge sorting exercise because the clinical staff were very motivated to do a lot of sorting. But having this data, we started rethinking, um, hmm, uh, are we going to solve uh, the plastic problem only by sorting more? Because our data shows us there's actually not so much plastic, which it gives sense, uh, makes sense to sort, and it will be very difficult for us. Uh, so what, what is the way ahead from here? So we have actually taken three different routes in combination uh, uh, in order to move ahead from here. We are uh, sorting, but we are only sorting those types of plastic um, which where we know there is a recycling, guaranteed recycling route within the boundaries of Denmark. We are not yet sending plastic packaging for recycling across the borders. It might change in the future because the technologies and the, the regulation around it at the EU level is changing, luckily. Uh, but when we started, we were focusing on types of plastic which we knew we could recycle. And we have taken that very, very far away. Uh, in one of our hospitals, they have sorted out HDPE and they have had produced their own chairs out of the plastic they sorted. Some of you might have met my colleague Maria, who's been behind that exercise. And this is uh, one of the more interesting um, things we've done. Also, a lot of the plastic has been uh, uh, sold, well, well reprocessed, and then been put into playground tools. This was also a case to prove the purity of the plastic, which we can sort out at a hospital. The quality of the plastic is so high, so you can actually make playground tools out of it. And the point about doing so was um, this playground tool company, they are also active at the US market and the standards for playground tools in the US market is so high. So if you could come up to that level, uh, you know that you have a very, very, very high quality product. So these were some kind of showcases we wanted to demonstrate what can actually come out of this. We have also been thinking that Okay, um, one easy, well, relatively easy way to solve the problem would be to reduce our consumption in general, because if you reduce your consumption in general, you also reduce your waste. So we have div a, a, a lot of activities now going on with the purpose to reduce consumption and by that reduce also, of course, our plastic packaging waste. And that always works and that always helps and you can do nothing wrong. Uh, we have wards where they just by going through all their carpets and the whole sortiment they have in their ward have reduced their co consumption by 30%. In, 
including, of course, also the waste from the department. And it's tons of waste we are talking about. They can reduce uh, over a year by just going to everything you have in your cupboard and make sure that you have exactly what you need and nothing more than that. And it, it, it takes a keen mind and a keen hand and a keen eye to do so. But it's, it's happening now with us and we are looking forward to scale up these things also. The last thing we've been thinking about and which I'm going to share more in detail with you is to start the dialogue with our suppliers. And also here, um, we have been talking to our colleagues uh, across the Nordic countries and I'm very happy also to, thank you Andrea, uh, to get the opportunity to share this also with colleagues outside the Nordic countries. We have for a long time and yeah, long time been working on developing some common criteria for more climate and environmental sustainable packaging. Uh, because we thought um, if waste is a problem, then maybe some common criteria might be part of the solution. The situation for us in the Nordic countries and maybe also Netherlands and Belgium and other smaller countries like ours. Actually, if we come up with some criteria individually, we are all too small, small to really influence the market. But if we join forces, then the market might start listening to us. And uh, I'm very happy that we have had this extremely good and also very patient cooperation because frankly, also during last year, during COVID, uh, most of us working on these criteria are also working in procurement departments. So we were also kind of uh, front desk workers in, during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, uh, so uh, we, we lost track of things during uh, the COVID uh, pandemic, but we picked it up. And we are now in the process of hearing uh, with uh, the industry, MedTech Europe, and also uh, the Nordic uh, MedTech um, business associations. And I'm very happy to say that the business has taken it very, very seriously and they're going very thoroughly to it. We expect their replies by the end of September. So we're very, very interested uh, to see, okay, how far can we take them? Also, we are now taking steps uh, through our the Danish Environmental Protection Agency to lift this up at European level, because this is what some of the larger suppliers have re uh, advised us to make this a European uh, joint effort as quick as possible. We were not really prepared for that one, but we are trying to do as far as we can. And we are really calling on all good forces, including healthcare without harm, to help us in doing so, because this is actually not our job, but we see this as uh, very important to get done. But let me take you, just give you very, very brief uh, introduction to what's inside the, these criteria. If you will take the next slide, Ariana. Mm. There is uh, some planning tools uh, in, in the criteria. This is written, of course, to procurement officers. Uh, and what steps should a procurement officer take in order to determine what level and what type of criteria could be put into uh, one specific uh, procurement document. Uh, the thing is that we see that the market develop not uh, uniformly. Some parts of the market is very advanced, while other parts of the market is not, has not really started yet. And in order not to compromise competition, we think it's important to move smoothly forward. The criteria we have here in, in this document uh, are divided at different levels. So the, the thing will be to determine what, what level can we put the criteria on in this specific procurement and in this specific market. The idea is to give a clear direction to the market in 10 years, this is where we would like you to be. So you know, this is what we expect from you. And this there is a solid market demand behind these criteria. So you can be confident if you start investing in developing in this direction. So there's different steps and different criteria you will need to, uh, to consider uh, when you are planning your procurement. Uh, so this is one part of the tools insights. And if you go to the next, 
slide, Ariana. Can you go to the next slide? Yeah, okay, time. Okay, so there are um, a cross list of criteria. Uh, this is going to be a little bit uh, copy-paste where you just have to determine, okay, what level of criteria. Uh, the focus is on reducing the weight of packaging. And the, this is true, the whole structure of all the different types of criteria. There's uh, numbers of criteria you can choose between. And if you take the next slide, <clears throat> there is also an evaluation tool where the idea is that what we request the suppliers to do is to uh, fill in uh, the weight of the different materials included in the packaging. And then we have decided a factor uh, scientifically based uh, on CO2 equivalent emissions so, which we multiply the weight with, and then we get a score. And if we add all together all the scores, then you have an easy way to compare the different types of packaging. Uh, right now, as I said, this is in the hearing. And when we have had the answers by the end of September and we have processed it, uh, I think uh, when we're ready, we'll be happy, of course, to share the results uh, also with all of you here. And, and maybe you will also like to join us uh, and use the tools that will be wonderful. So thank you very much. I think time is running over, so I better wrap up now. Thank you, thank you, Susanne. Was that the last slide or I interrupted? Yeah, okay, that's great. Um, let me have a look at the questions. Some of them have been answered already. Uh, one question is about where can we find the criteria and uh, Susanna, you already answered that. Um, so one thing is that I wanted... Hmm. Yeah? One thing, I, the criteria, we, we I think we should not share them right now because they are not final, they're in the process. So when they're final, we'll share them. Yeah. Okay. And uh, so I think that uh, some of the questions perhaps can be answered after the webinar, uh, either by the speaker or by us. I see here that there is a whole question about biodegradable uh, plastics and bioplastics. So that is uh, for a full other webinar, uh, but we can follow up with uh, who answered this question. Um, I don't know if any of you any, have any questions for the other speakers in the room uh, or would like to give a final comment before we, we conclude. Okay, so I think we are, we are good. Uh, it was very, very interesting for us to, to learn from uh, your experience, very different uh, audits and settings, uh, but I think that uh, we all seen very interesting results and uh, uh, good input on things that uh, we could work on uh, in the future and uh, collaborate on, especially on the most common items that uh, can be found in the, uh, in the waste um, across all the hospitals. So um, we can continue to collaborate uh, on that with uh, Health Care Without Harm Europe and the project participants. Um, with that, I'd like to close the webinar. I thank again our speakers. And uh, we will uh, uh, share the recording and the slides and uh, also sign up to our newsletter because soon we will be sharing the uh, plastic reduction toolkit for the hospitals that contain this methodology and the, the case studies. So thank you very much for uh, joining us today and have a good rest of your day. Bye.